Welcome. This is David Bowles, Human Meme. Today's topic, Disability and Indifference. There was a time in America and the world when the disabled among us were not just pitied, but helped and taken care of by the rest of society as part of the duty of a higher calling. Now that is still generically true, at least on the surface, but it's not as right as it used to be a decade ago, and not as protected legally as it was 25 years ago with the introduction of the Americans with Disabilities Act, signed into law in 1990 in the United States of America. The ADA provided basic, equal treatment under the law for the disabled that dealt with employment, interpreters, facilitators, internet access, video relay services, and access to barrier-free buildings. For many years, the ADA was great. A lot of lawyers made a lot of money bringing lawsuits against cities and businesses to bend them into compliance with the law, with legal speed and lots of payout money. Then, once a basic equilibrium was reached and there was no more money to be made in the courts bringing lawsuits for compliance, the ADA has slowly, over the last decade or so, been shriveling in significance as access to services and buildings and interpreters is in quiet decline. Malcolm Gladwell calls this the theory of the token, and he argues, quite rightly, that people feel better about themselves when they do one right socially approved act once, and then never again. Think of the first black president, the first professional woman painter, the first law that protects equal access for the disabled. Gladwell's theory goes, once people do something right to feel better about themselves, they will never do it again because the mob mentality says to them, whispering in their ear, we've already done that. And then a feeling of resentment and hatred rises as these tokens are then projected to have special treatment and powers that are unfair and disproportionate to their status in society. And so everyone else who comes up next in line, the second token, the third, the fourth, are reviled and punished and not allowed the sanction and forgiveness of the original token. Today you could argue there is tremendous resentment against the disabled because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and a lot of it's hidden and subtle, where it creeps and grows and becomes moldy where once the ADA meant something. Now it is looked upon with some disdain and indifference and tokenism, which are all actually more poisonous than flat-out hatred. In my Omni Trium Perfectum, The Rule of Three podcast, I visited Freud's The Theme of the Three Caskets and how the lead casket, the third choice, the devalued option, 
often spoke to muteness and plainness and futility. The goddess of death was the winning result, and in the muteness of the modern Americans with Disabilities Act, we have rediscovered the lead-lined coffin in the struggle for ongoing, undiminished equal rights. Last month in Japan, the worst murder spree in the post-war history of that country came to life in the deaths of 19 disabled people who were targeted solely for their disability. And, in effect, they were purposefully euthanized by their killer. He did not want them alive. Check out my article, The Ugly Laws, published at bowlsblogs.com, for more information on how, in history, the ugly and the disabled were barred from even being seen in public in many American cities. In the more recent example of Japan, is there a difference in cutting the throat of those who are unable to respond to a killer's test directive? Do you understand me or not? If not, you die. Then it is to quietly smother a disabled revolution in civil rights by refusing to fully abide the rules and requirements of the law of the land. I argue that substantially the effect is the same. To euthanize the disabled in order to keep the status quo objectified and in power. The erosion of humanity and humility in our killers and in our social fabric may have different intentions, but the same conclusion. The disabled are not worth saving, let alone keeping alive to take up space and resources and time and money in an ever-shrinking societal economy. This is not new thinking. Eugenics has been a popular idea in the USA since the 1880s, and every generation or so it is resolved to be a right solution to a special social problem. Read my Pillow Angels article at bowlsblogs.com for a more recent take on eugenics in disguise. The most recent Bureau of Labor Statistics report on disability employment from 2015 makes a compelling example of who and what we value in the marketplace. For those who want to work, 17.5% of persons with a disability were employed, and those without a disability were employed at 65%. Persons with a disability were about three times as likely as those with no disability to be aged 65 and over. For all age groups, the employment population ratio was much lower for persons with a disability than for those with no disability. Employment rates were higher for persons with a disability than for those with no disability among all educational attainment groups. In 2015, 32% of workers with a disability were employed part-time, compared with 18% of those with no disability. Workers with a disability were more likely to be self-employed than those with no disability. This erosion of the self of us in a reflexive society is also evidenced in how we view disability as a people. For example, 
My wife and I recently had our DNA tested with 23andMe. I was a genetic carrier of nothing, but Jana had two carrier marker warnings in her DNA profile. One for cystic fibrosis, surprised us, but not a problem since we willfully do not have children and do not plan to have children and a second marker, which we knew about, for congenital deafness. We knew Jana's deafness was caused by an RH factor incompatibility between her parents, and RH factor isn't often evidenced in the first couple of births. But then the blood turns on the third baby in line and presents itself and that RH incompatibility behaved just as expected in the birth of my beloved wife. In her 23andMe report, congenital deafness was noted, and in the advice section on what to do about it, there were no cultural solutions like deaf institutional education or Deaf cultural memes, there was only the medical view of deafness, that she was broken and needed to be fixed, and 23andMe suggested she either get hearing aids or a cochlear implant. It was disappointing to see even 23andMe take such a dim, fatalistic, euthanistic view of disability in comparison to what it means to live and thrive as a genetically disinclined human with carrier markers. When 23andMe asked for feedback on their service, here's what Jana wrote. Negative view of deafness as a gene carrier only medical remedies are provided in your suggestive analysis and consequences. No cultural identification support. No American Sign Language acquisition recommendation. Only you need to be fixed medically. Being disabled has never been an honor. It is always a chore. Nobody wishes or wants to be truly disabled. And while there may be superstar overachiever outliers, like Helen Keller, who are able to persevere despite multiple crippling disabilities, the hard fact remains that to be disabled is to be permanently and physically changed. And you are no longer average and the obstacles set against you just because of who you were born to be are often so insurmountable that the easiest solution sometimes is the feeling to give in to the temptation of the theory of a serial killer's social culling to cut the fat from the meat of the social fabric. Instead of having to stand up repeatedly every single day for each moment of the rest of your life to prove who you are and what you need to be in the most basic, decent, possible way, while knowing, without really confessing, that you'll never really truly be equal or the same, or safe, because you're just a token for the spending, and only a meme for the reckoning. Thank you for listening. Be a human meme.